Welcome to Rogue Valley Fellowship. I'm glad you're here tonight. Uh, we're glad that you're here to worship with us. Uh, tonight we're going to hear from Kenner out of John chapter 20. We're going to be focusing on the resurrection of Christ. Last week we heard about the crucifixion and how the crucifixion is the victory of God to defeat evil. But the resurrection uh, is the power by which the victory of the cross comes to bear on our world. And so God from the beginning of time has been working one plan. He's made one promise and his plan has never changed and it will never change there's nothing that has happened that has surprised him and things are unfolding exactly as he says that they will and that is good news for us in a crazy world isn't it and so as we worship tonight um, i'm going to read to you a few verses from first corinthians chapter 15 and we will start singing after that for if the dead are not raised, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. And so we gather tonight to worship the risen Lord the one who has conquered sin and death and evil. And by his resurrection, the power of the victory of the cross comes to bear on our lives and in our world. So let's worship tonight with joy. Go ahead and stand. Precious blood of Jesus. 
the beginning and the end. Let's sing that.
everything in your hands help us to trust you tonight think of the things that he's done for you the things that he's brought you through the way he's allowed us to experience his love. God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. What sad could be equal to his own the cross of Christ has declared that there is not I owe yet I know Magnificent 
Good to uh, it's good to see you guys. How are you? Wow, that was that was amazingly bad, <laughs> amazingly bad. Well, like Billy said, crazy week, uh, crazy weekend. Uh, to be honest, it was a lot closer than I thought it was going to be, um, and it was an incredible comeback. And when after the victory, all the people just went out there and celebrated like that, I was a little surprised. Um, I didn't think Notre Dame had it in them to win the game, but wow, that was a great game. Oh, some, yeah, that's right. See, we just needed a little stress relief for everybody. So it went over better in first service, but that's cool. Um, you guys were like, what is he? Wow, he's going there. <laughs> oh, guys, come on. You know what I'd be doing, watching football my escape. So <clears throat> played, watched a lot of football and played uh, some video games this weekend, and that's how I survived whatever it was that happened this week. So, um, but hey, it's good to be with you guys tonight. Would you guys stand this evening uh, for the reading of God's word to us? Uh, we'll be in John chapter 20, uh, verses 1 through 18 tonight. And so this is the word of the Lord to his people through uh, John the Apostle. So the word of the Lord to us, John chapter 1, verse 18, says, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. And the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she went, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to him, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing. But she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? <clears throat> Suppose him to be the gardener. She said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary... And she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. And this is the word of the Lord, and God's people responded. Amen. You guys may be seated tonight. <clears throat> John's gospel ends where Mark's gospel ends and uh, Matthew and Luke's gospel ends. And it's where you, um, having known the gospel story, you would expect their story to culminate with the resurrection of Jesus. 
Um, but John has taken us uh, over the last, really the last year we've been in John, kind of in and out for different reasons. Uh, but he's taken us all the way through the life of Jesus. Uh, John's gospel is unique in that uh, much of the material that we've looked at uh, is unique to John's gospel. Matthew, Mark, and Luke had already written theirs. Um, and so John takes a much more thematic approach uh, to his gospel than Matthew, Mark, or Luke. Uh, they tend to take particularly Luke, uh, maybe a more chronological approach to the life of Jesus. Um, and John, so therefore, as an author, kind of fills in with a number of themes. And one of the themes that John has laid out in the beginning of his gospel is the idea of creation and new creation. You remember that he kind of parallels his first few verses in John chapter 1 to Genesis chapter 1. In Genesis chapter 1, we read, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? And in John chapter 1, we read that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He the Logos, Jesus, was with God in the beginning. And he goes on to say that all things that have been made came into being through the Logos, through the Word, through the Son, through Jesus. And so John has, as an author, kind of thematically played on that idea of the Genesis account of creation uh, and light and darkness and so on and so forth. And he's kind of played with those all the way through his gospel. And although we didn't look at it last week, even the idea of Jesus um, uh, proclaiming it is finished on the cross and then being laid to rest and then being in the tomb on the seventh day. And then we'll see this morning rising uh, from the dead to symbol, uh, to symbolize or to proclaim uh, that new creation is beginning with the resurrection of the Son of God. And that's really much of the story of the scriptures. You'll remember that scripture as a whole, Genesis to Revelation, and then the focal points obviously being the life of Christ in the gospel, is the story of God creating, man destroying or rebelling, and then God rescuing and recreating. And there's this important parallel between creation and then, as we'll see this morning, resurrection. And it's not just that God is, is redeeming and creating um, the world in general, and it's not just that humanity in general is in rebellion against God and as if evil and sin are somehow outside of us, but the story of redemption and restoration, of creation, fall, redemption, and restoration, is something that actually is in our own individual personal lives as well. And so as Edmund Clowney says, it's important as we approach the scriptures, as we look at the entire narrative of the Bible, that we see it as more than simply a bewildering collection of oracles, proverbs, poems, architectural directions, or prophecies. No, he says the Bible is a storyline and it traces an unfolding drama. And that story is God's story. It describes his work to rescue rebels from folly, guilt, and ruin. And only God's revelation could maintain a drama that stretches over a thousand years as though they were simply days and hours. And again, we encounter things in our life that we can't foresee, that we didn't know was coming around the corner. And much of our life is, try, is, is spent trying to alleviate as many surprises in life as we can to give ourselves a sense of security and peace and, and, and well-being. But God's story, the history of the world, is unfolding exactly how God has ordained it to unfold. Clowney goes on to say that only God's revelation can build a story where the end of redemption and restoration is anticipated from the beginning and where the guiding principle of this story is not chance or fate, but a promise, the promise that God shapes history to a real and ultimate purpose. That, that what guides the history of mankind, what guides the history of the world is not chance, is not fate, is not democracy, is not a vote, but the sovereign hand of God. And he's guiding it to an ultimate end goal. And that end goal is where all things, as Paul says in Ephesians chapter one, is that all things will be summed up in Christ in which Christ is the head and everything is submitted to him in the new creation. And we as the people of God are co-heirs with Christ in the new creation. That's the promise, that's the hope, 
That's the telos, that's the end goal of not only creation, but the people of God as we participate in that vision with Christ. And it is built on the promise of God's sovereignty, God's grace, God's mercy, God's kindness, God's redemption, and his intention to redeem and restore all things. May we not exchange that for some temporary, finite promise of a better tomorrow or a better whatever. May we as the people of God keep our eyes fixed on the biblical narrative of not only creation and fall and redemption, but as we see this evening in the resurrection, restoration as well. And that is the outline of scripture. Creation, starting again in Genesis chapter one, where we see on the first day, God takes darkness. And even as we see in John chapter 20, what does it say? She came to the tomb early while it was still what? dark, right? So John plays on dark and light, just like we see in Genesis chapter 1. And he's coming on the first day of the week. And we saw, as we looked at last week, that it was finished on the sixth day. And then he rested on the seventh. The fall tells us, again, the man's rebellion against God and their attempt to establish kingdoms that always rival God's kingdom, but God's plan to redeem all things, to bring salvation to mankind. And John has already told us this in John chapter three, verse 16, for God so loved the world, right? That he sent his only son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. And then he goes on in verse 17 and 18 to say, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. And the means of this mission, accomplishing this mission, were the incarnate deity, God becoming man, Christ taking on human flesh, God indwelling uh, humanity through uh, Jesus, um, as John chapter 1 says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, or as Eugene Peterson uh, renders that, uh, he moved into the neighborhood or he tabernacled among us. There's all these different ways we get to the idea of God becoming a man, living the life that we couldn't live, and then dying the death that we should have died, his atoning death. And then finally, the literal resurrection is how this redemption and restoration is accomplished. The resurrection is not... Uh, a peripheral piece to the gospel message. It's central and it gives meaning to all that preceded it. As N.T. Wright says, in Jesus, God had become present. He had become human. He had come to live in the midst of his people, to set up his kingdom, to take upon himself the full horror of their plight and to bring about his long awaited new world. And this message, this gospel message, oftentimes uh, is viewed uh, as suspect by people. It comes under attack from the world. Was Jesus really God is a question that we often are asked. Wasn't his life simply meant to be an example? Is there really significance in death, in his death on the cross? Was that necessary? And one of the biggest questions that our faith has to stand up against is whether Jesus truly, literally rose from the dead. And it's good for the people of God, for the followers of Jesus to stop, to meditate, and to reflect on the reality that one of the core tenets, one of the core beliefs that we have as Jesus followers is that we believe he literally rose from the dead, that he was crucified, he was brutally beaten, crucified, lifeless body laid in a tomb and a stone rolled over it. And then three days later, rose literally, not spiritually, not metaphorically, but truly, literally rose from the dead. And that gives meaning and gravitas to everything that proceeded in Jesus's life. And so the resurrection is central to our faith. John's account in John chapter 20 is central to our faith. As G. Campbell Morgan says, the resurrection gives meaning to all that preceded it. By it, the cross was proved to be more than a tragic death, and the life of Jesus infinitely more than an example. Upon the fact of the historic resurrection stands or falls the whole fabric of Christianity. And it's why Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John 
all of their stories culminate in that last week of Jesus' life with the cross being central and the resurrection being the final story that they share about Jesus' life. And it's why the New Testament authors pick up on the cross and resurrection and then interpret reality through that. Through that event of cross and resurrection, they reinterpret how they see everything. Through the life of Christ, through the death of Christ, through the resurrection of Christ, and as we'll see, through the ascension of Christ. This is how they view reality, and it's how the disciple is asked and called to view reality. And so in John chapter 20, what we see is this first day where Mary comes to the tomb. And as John says, again, playing on the Genesis 1 light and darkness themes, says that Mary comes while it's still dark. Mary uh, has followed Jesus for a long time, three years, spent quite a bit of time listening to his teaching. She loved him dearly and was loved dearly by him. She had put much of her hope in his message of redemption and restoration of God's kingdom in the here and now. And you can imagine just a few days prior to this, the trauma and the grief and the loss and the angst and the sadness and the hopelessness that she would then be experiencing having watched Jesus be crucified and his body laid into the, into the tomb. And so in that place of grief and loss, she continues to go to the tomb and to see Jesus' body so she could continue to prepare it for its final burial and resting place. You remember that it was kind of rushed because of the Sabbath. And so they quickly took his body off and they wrapped it and they put it in a tomb to come back to. And so Mary goes early in the morning. She peeks in and she notices that the tomb is empty. So John as an author lets us know that Mary sees the tomb as empty. And then she runs back and she goes and she talks to the disciples and she goes to Peter and John, uh, two of Jesus' closest friends, some of his confidants, and they too hear this and they now run to the tomb. And it says John gets there first and he kind of peeks in and he sees that he doesn't see a body. Peter comes and he blasts by John, runs right into the tomb, and he notices that the body is missing. The tomb is empty. So now Mary has said the tomb is empty. John lets us know. And John lets us know that Peter says the tomb is empty. And then John, it says that John then peeks in and then he enters. And it says that he sees that the tomb is empty and he believes. This idea of seeing and believing, another theme that John talks about in his gospel. And so John lets us know that as well. So he lets us know three eyewitness accounts that the tomb was empty. There's no body in the tomb. What do you think, as an author, John wants us to know? The tomb is empty, right? He wants us to know that. And he does so by establishing, he he establishes truth based on fact, based on trustworthy eyewitness testimony. That's an important, like, way we build truth, right? We don't just get to pick truth. We're not just going to make it up. There is absolute truth, you know? And culturally, we see what happens when people have a less than uh, honest relationship with the truth, right? When the truth is always being challenged, it's hard for society to stand on anything when, well, that's your truth and this is my truth. And how do we establish truth? Well, historically, we go back and we look at facts and much of facts can be traced to trustworthy eyewitness testimony. Can we believe the people that are being brought forth? And that's what the New Testament authors do. And that's what John does. And he brings Mary and he brings Peter and he brings John forth to let us know the tomb is empty. There is no body. And he wants us to know this. And he says, John looking back says, he sees it and believes. And he said, but we didn't understand in the moment that the scripture had to be fulfilled, that Jesus would be raised from the dead. That looking back, they see with clearer vision that the Old Testament had pointed to the reality that Messiah would rise from the dead. Again, Psalm 16 would be one of those passages, verse 10, where the psalmist writes, Therefore my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol and let your Holy One see corruption. And so they look back and they interpret The Old Testament, 
through the reality of Jesus' literal resurrection. And so John goes to great lengths just in these 10 verses to let us know the body is not there, the tomb is empty. So then the next logical question is, where is the body? And so he picks up in verse 11, and he leaves Mary at the scene of the tomb. Mary continues to wait. She continues to sit in her grief and in her loss and in her trauma and in her pain. And if you've ever sat in trauma and pain and loss and it goes longer than you had expected, it, it is unbelievably difficult. Because you want so badly for the loss or the pain just to stop. And Mary just continues to sit. And John's focal point, outside of Jesus here, obviously, his focal point is on Mary. And her response, her, her, her response in rising early and going to the tomb, her response in telling Peter and John that Jesus' body is missing, her response in staying in the place of pain and waiting. And it says that two angels appear and they ask the question, why are you weeping? Alone, in this tomb, in this moment of death and loss, she sits by herself weeping. And these two angels appear to her and they ask her the question and she says, because they've taken my Lord's body and I don't know where they've placed it. She's still not understanding, obviously, all that's going on. She, she, she just sees what's in front of her, and the body is missing, and this is horrific in her experience, and understandably so. But then the, John tells us that in verse 15, Jesus speaks to her, and Jesus asks her two questions. The same one that the angels had asked, why are you weeping? But then he also asks, whom are you seeking? And then John says, supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him. John returns to the scene of a garden, right? And it's as if, you know, if you think back at Genesis 1, 2, and 3, everything started in this garden, the Garden of Eden, and everything goes horribly wrong in the Garden of Eden. And then John, as an author, lets us know that the gardener, the great gardener, has returned to the garden to redeem and restore. To redeem and to restore. To fulfill God's original purpose for his good creation. He did not abandon it. He does not call it bad. He does not call it evil, the material universe. No, he enters into it to redeem and restore it. And John picks up on the theme of the garden and the great gardener being present. And he says, what are you, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And connected with that is, what are you looking for, Mary? What is it that you're looking for in this? You know, for, for, for Mary, Jesus had, had, had fulfilled those, those needs that she'd had for belonging, for, for, for forgiveness, for kindness, to be seen, to be heard, for purpose. And then all of that in a moment was taken away from her because Jesus was crucified. And we spend much of our life looking for someone or something to fulfill all of those things that we long for. And Mary had found that. And then it, in essence, she feels as though it's been taken away. And so she continues to sit and wait at the tomb of Jesus. And the gardener returns and he asks her the question. And then Jesus says, Mary, he calls her by name. And at this moment, Mary knows who it is. Maybe you have that kind of a relationship with your family or your husband and wife or your children or your parents. Like, you know When they say your name, it's different than everybody else. My mom is the only one. Typically with moms, it's because they add your middle name. You know what I mean? It's never Kenner with my mom. It's Kenner Allen. That's what it is. And she's the only, now you all know. She's the only one. Don't even, Travis. Travis is looking at me like, oh, it's over, son. It's over. I got your middle name. 
she's the only one that uses my name, well, until I got married. And now it's, it's, it's my mother and my wife both use that name, right? And I know it, and it's, and it's the emphasis on Allen. It's like, Kenner Allen? That's how it goes. It's, I want to think Jesus isn't saying Mary, like it's a bad thing. I think it's much more compassionate than that, um, I hope. And so, but the idea that Mary, Jesus speaks her name and she knows. What does John tell us that Jesus said about his sheep? My sheep, what? Hear my voice. They know my voice. And I know them. And now Mary, who's one of his sheep, hears his voice. And she goes, I know that voice. That's not the angel's voice. That's not Peter's voice. That's not John's voice. There's only one voice like that. That's Jesus's voice. Do you know the voice of Jesus in your life? Does it stand out distinct from all other voices? Gordon Smith wrote a great book called The Voice of Jesus. I think highly recommend it. But do you know the voice of Jesus? When he speaks, do you hear it as distinct from other voices? And so Mary turns to him and she goes to cling him and Jesus tells her of some great um, new reality that has taken place because of the resurrection. A number of Easter's ago, you'll remember that one of my statements was, Jesus has risen from the dead, so what? Not like, so what, but like, so what does that mean? Like, Christians are notorious for statements of fact without interpreting the significance. Jesus died on the cross. Why? Why? To what end? To what purpose? Jesus rose from the dead. Okay, these are facts. We believe them to be true. But what bearing do they have on the day-to-day experience of the Christian? How do we interpret the life? Jesus is God. Okay. We want to interpret the, the, the facts. We want to interpret the meaning. And so what Jesus tells Mary after John lays out the reality of the resurrection in verses 1 through 10 is the relational implications of the resurrection for Mary and Peter and John and James and Matthew and Luke and then Paul and then Dave and Randall and Danny and Steph. You know, like, what is the implications of it? It's that the fundamental relationship with God's people has changed because of the resurrection. Jesus says, do not cling to me, Mary, but go tell your brothers, so he's using familial language now, go tell your brothers that I'm going to ascend to my father and what? Your father. Now again, we've grown up hearing God as father, but that is a unique claim that the the, the children of God get to claim. And it's unique in John's gospel. 71 times as the Father. This is the first time John refers to God as the disciple's Father. And the disciples being Jesus' brothers. Now, Matthew, Mark, and Luke may record that earlier, but for John's purposes, this is when he uses that sort of language. After the resurrection. Because of Jesus' death, resurrection, and exaltation, his disciples come to share in his sonship to the Father. And so this evening, Rogue Valley Fellowship, as we continue to meditate and keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, and as we look at the reality of the resurrection, may we interpret its significance, reminding us of two things tonight. That number one, the resurrection has defeated The power of death. In the resurrection, Jesus has defeated the power of death. This is why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 22, for as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. The cross and the resurrection is connected to the life that God gives us as his people. If you have time this evening, go read Romans 5, chapter chapter 5, verses 10 through 21, where Paul talks about the reality that through the one Adam's disobedience brings sin and then therefore death, the second Adam, Christ, his obedience brings righteousness and life as a free gift. Through his life, through his death, through his burial, through his resurrection, and through his ascension, But as infinitely powerful and great as the reality that death is defeated, 
the resurrection also reveals to us that our relationship and our position with God has changed. Where, as Paul will say in Romans 5, we move not only from enemies, we don't only just move to friends, but we actually move to family. We are adopted into God's family. Not just legally, but relationally. Where he really just, he loves us as his children. It's not just a, a legal thing that, that he talks about, like, oh, it's great that I'm adopted. I appreciate that. Thanks. He, he, it's the reality of, of our relationship with him as sons and daughters. And we spend so much of our Christian life struggling to accept the fact that you are accepted. You are accepted by God in Christ. Loved. Brought in. You, you need not worry about your position in the family if you are in Christ. You are a son. You are a daughter. Safe and secure forever. This is good news. And it's something the enemy plays on, constantly calling into question our belonging in the family. Does he really love you? Are you really his daughter? Are you really his son? You know, if you do that one more time, he's probably going to, like, boot you. You know you've really disappointed him. And the enemy just sits there. But Mary, this morning, as she sat in her grief and her trauma in her tomb, one of the things that Jesus speaks to her is, you are part of my family now. Go tell my brothers that I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Because he has risen from the dead. Not only is death defeated, but we belong in the family of God. This is why Galatians in chapter 4, Paul tells us we cry out to God. Um, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so we're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. We have the promise of an inheritance as his children. We have the assurance of God's love as his children. And we have the blessing and security of his acceptance. And so this morning, or this evening, um, I ask that question that Jesus asked Mary. Whom are you seeking? Whom are you seeking? For Mary, it was Jesus. Even in the midst of loss and trauma and grief and sadness, she's still seeking him. She's sitting outside of his tomb. Even when she thinks he's dead and gone, she's still seeking him. How much more now that he's alive? And what is it that we think we're going to find in pursuing anything other than Jesus. Because Jesus offers life, as we've seen. Jesus offers belonging, as we've seen. And so this evening, may we come to Jesus. May we seek him above all things. May he fulfill those greatest desires that we have, those temptations that oftentimes we're tempted to turn from seeking him for immediate relief or gratification when we're tempted in our pain and our loss to abandon hope and to walk away from Jesus, may we continue to sit and wait and may you hear his voice and may that bring peace and assurance of his love and your place in his family this evening. Amen? Amen. Jeremy and the guys are gonna come close in a song and then uh, Combsy will give the benediction. So Father, I thank you for this evening and I thank you for this church. And I pray as we continue to meditate this week on the resurrection that we would keep our eyes fixed on you, our living hope, and may that bring us confidence and assurance of your love for us and our security in you. May we come to accept the reality that we are accepted in you by your son, and may that bring safety. So we thank you for the resurrection and all that it means. It is a multifaceted diamond. We can look at the implications of it over and over, and there's always something new to learn. 
And so may you inspire us to trust you, to walk with you, and to keep our eyes on you. In Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Rabbi Jesus, as we have heard of your servant Mary this evening, 
We ask in humility to be given the grace to follow her example. In faithfulness to wait on you even when times are dark. In knowing the sound of your voice when you call out our names. In the desire to cling to you in full trust and security. And in boldness to proclaim the good news of your resurrection regardless of the doubts of others. We thank you for the witness of our sister Mary and how you've used her testimony of the empty tomb throughout the ages of your church. All glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in the peace of Christ.